German critic, weil hey, außer mir macht's ja keiner. And on this episode, we're going to be talking about pirates. In this episode, we won't be talking about Illyrians, Buccaneers, or Somalis, though. Instead, this time, we'll be taking a look at a rather unknown chapter in pirate history. Unknown, unless you're German, that is. But in order to even understand the subject matter of this episode, I think it's time for a little history lesson. Our story begins with death. The Black Death, to be more precise. Much like everywhere else in Europe, the bubonic plague also ravaged the cities of the Hanseatic League. Lübeck, Stralsund, and of course Hamburg all fell prey to the infestation. This naturally left a power vacuum with the lucrative trade routes as prize to be claimed. In order to do this, both the Hanseatic League as well as the Duchy of Mecklenburg hired mercenaries. But what do you do when all the wars are fought, all the territory is staked out, and no need for anyone to hire you anymore. Simple, you turn to crime, banditry, and piracy. Primarily operating in the 1390s, the so-called Vitalian Brüder, Vitalian Brothers, became a fierce and brutal collection of pirates, terrorizing the respectable businessmen of the Hanseatic League and plundering their ships. And this, my dear viewers, is where today's feature comes in. Released in 2009, Zwölf Meter ohne Kopf, 40 Feet Headless, tells the story of famous German pirates Klaus Störtebecker and his brother-at-arms, Goodeke Mickels. Now, with regards to this movie, I have to say, I didn't really have a lot of high hopes going into it, as it did have a lot of things going against it right from the get-go. Case in point, the box art. Take a look at this cover and tell me what's wrong with it. No, it's not Schweighöfer. We'll get to him in a minute. I'll give you another five seconds to figure it out, okay? Still haven't figured it out? This movie takes place in 1400 and 1401. What the fuck is the Jolly Roger doing on this cover? That didn't exist until like 200 years after our period. <sighs> but that's not the only setback for this movie. There's also the trailer. You see, the trailer makes it look like this is some kind of buddy comedy. You know, Stratebecker and Mickles, brothers till the end. And then some broad comes along and ruins everything. Thankfully, the movie doesn't take that route, and I'll explain why once we get there. And lastly, there's Schweighöfer himself. How can I best describe his career thus far? Think of him as the male counterpart to Catherine Hegel. Whenever people hear Schweighöfer, the things that come to their mind are annoying rom-coms and unfunny comedies. Now, he has made an effort to sort of steer away from that image, but if you take a look at what he's done recently, yeah, still rather mediocre. But, as I previously said, despite having zero hopes going into this film, it did genuinely surprise me. So, let's set sail for the high seas as we take a look at 12 Meter ohne Kopf, 40 feet headless. Oh, and before some annoying faggot goes berserk in the comment section, 12 meters are of course not 40 feet precisely and 39.370079 feet doesn't exactly sound well on a title card, does it? So the film begins in 1401 with Störtebecker's execution. 
or does it? Was denn? Das ist nicht Klaus Störtebecker. Nee, das ist er gar nicht. Ja? In nachweislich 654 ja Fällen gefährliche Körperverletzung mit Todesfolge in 756 Sie Fällen. Sie müssen das hier abbrechen. Das ist gar kein angemessenes Verfahren. Das ist überhaupt nicht angemessen. Sag mal, habt ihr einen Knall? Jump back a year, we were introduced to Klaus Störtebecker, played by Ronald Zerfeld, and his pirate buddy Gödeke Mikkels, played by Matthias Schweighöfer, commanding their ship. We're also introduced to the crew, but honestly, I can't remember a single one of them. The only one I'll mention here is Lupe, and the only reason I do so is because he actually does play a minor role at the end of the film. The film then shows our heroes in action. We get sword fights, medieval naval siege weapons, you name it. But this raid isn't like any other though. Why? Because Stöttebecker gets severely wounded in the process, which causes him to start doubting everything they've been doing for the past few years. Cut to Marienhafen, which is essentially Mikkels and Stöttebecker's home port. There, they talk to their contact, Tom Broke, played by Peter Kurt, who supplies them with ships because they want more money. We're also introduced to Oka, played by Jana Palaske, and Bille, played by Franziska Wolf. And this is where I was quite surprised. Remember what I said of the trailer and what kind of picture I painted for this film? Turns out, I was completely wrong, as the film clearly establishes that Mikkels and Oka have a thing going on, and Bille, a new waitress, is designed to be Störtebecker's love interest. So some guy talks shit to Mikkels, which culminates in a bar fight. Meanwhile, Bille and Störtebecker hit it off, but they get interrupted by her little sister Svenja. Sure, nowadays, this would be rather awkward, but... In medieval times, sex was practiced much sooner than today. Thus, children were exposed to it far sooner as children and adults slept in the same room and therefore witnessed their parents and grandparents having sex. This was something completely normal. And if you know where these lines come from, you know what we'll be taking a look at in the very near future. Back on the high seas, the crew stumbles upon the skeleton of Alta Knutzen, who was presumably the owner of the ship, along with a Chinese cannon. Of course, since this is 1400, no one knows what it is or what it does. They then see a British vessel sailing by and eagerly await Stratopeka's command to attack. He doesn't give the command, but instead lets the ship pass by and then hides below deck where he basically has a panic attack. Mikkels finds him and comforts him by telling Störtebecker he'll make everything better. And how does Mikkels intend to fix the fear of impending death? By buying frivolous materialistic shit, of course. We then see the crew talking to a weapons trader, played by Detlef Book. And even though he has a quite impressive catapult, they, as we already know, have no money to buy it. Mikkels even tries to bargain with the guy and promises him to pay once they've raided again. And as you might expect, the trader reacts like any serious businessman would and basically tells them to get fucked. Naturally, the intense situation on board makes the crew weary and restless. This then leads to a quote-unquote psychiatric scene where Störtebecker and his crew discuss their problems. The scene is supposed to be funny, but to me it just comes off as weird and nonsensical. This, of course, doesn't work and the crew stows away on a rowing boat in the middle of the night. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the night after that, 
Stratopeka decides to leave as well. Mikos tries to dissuade him from the plan by referring to his shitty life on the island of Rügen and how Störtebeker was the reason Mikos wanted to be a pirate in the first place. Yet, Störtebeker leaves anyway, which causes Mikos to try to commit suicide by hanging himself and burning the ship to the ground along with him. Fortunately for him, the fire he started ignites the black powder in the loaded cannon, causing it to fire in the process, knocking down the beam with the rope attached to it. <sighs> Even though, considering how much black powder is actually on the ship, it should have blown into fucking pieces. Having figured out what the cannon can do, Mikos and Stratopeka find the crew again, and we then get a montage of them capturing and raiding one ship after the other. And remember, most Europeans have never seen a cannon before, so this is the equivalent of Blackbeard fighting Maynard and then Blackbeard pulling out a fucking Gatlin. Or that awesome scene at the end of the Spoils of War. Of course, the battalion's actions severely harm the Hanseatic League, especially their precious quarterly numbers, and we get told that it'll be broke within three weeks if Mikkels and Stratebecker's raids continue. Q. Sven von Utrecht, played by David Striso, who then calls upon the two pirate hunters Lange and Schocke, played respectively by Alexander Scheer and Milan Peschel. Ein einseitig geschlossenes Bronze- oder Metallrohr, bestehend aus axial angeordneten Eisenstäben mit Ringverstärkung. Durch eine Lunte wird das in Kartuschen befindliche Schießpulver zur Explosion gebracht. Und zwar durch dieses Zündloch, welches sich hier im oberen Bereich befindet. Das Ergebnis ist verheerend. Um nicht zu sagen, genial. Sehr effektiv. Sehr interessant. Können wir das auch? Okay, so the number one question that's on my mind right now is how the hell do they even know all this? As I've previously said, this film takes place in 1400 and 1401. It'll be at least a century until firearms and cannons become a commonplace thing in European armies. There's only one way that this scene actually makes any semblance of sense, and that's if we think of Lange and Schocke as being a satire of some alleged experts. You know, the quote-unquote experts that get propped up whenever some kid shoots up his school or some Muslim guy drives a truck into a crowd of people and then try to explain the hows and whys to us plebs even though they themselves probably don't even have any idea what the fuck they're actually talking about. Regardless, we're back in Marienhafen, where Störtebeker hits it off with Bille again. Mikkel's relationship to Oka, however, comes to an abrupt halt as she tells him that she'll be marrying a man named Foko Johansen very soon. Needless to say, Mikkel doesn't take it very well. And by doesn't take it very well. I mean, he takes the guy, played by Simon Gose Johan, and then tries to castrate him until Störtebeka manages to put an end to it before it actually happens. But Mikkels having gone mad isn't the only problem as Lange and Schocke have arrived in Marienhafen where they immediately arrest Tom Broke. And what are they gonna do to him? What did you think they were going to do to him? On board, the crew starts making jokes about Mikkel's non-existent libido. As one might expect, Mikkel doesn't take it very well and immediately punishes Lupe by shoving him into a barrel for 20 hours, which is then tied to a rope and dragged along by the ship. 
Okay, so this is a really, really tiny nitpick here, but how does Mikkels know when the 20 hours have passed? I mean, they didn't really have any pocket watches back then, and back then, the only clocks that you could find were either on bell towers or on town halls. After the punishment, Schwertepeke and Mikkels again have a talk. The former talks about settling down, whereas the latter wants to remain a free man and make a name for himself. By this point, it's also become clear to Stratebeka that his best friend has gone completely mad. This realization is further enhanced when Mikkels gives an impassionate apology speech after it's been discovered that the rope of the barrel with Lupe inside it ripped and Lupe is now drifting across the open ocean. This drives Stratebeka to an act of desperation by tossing their prized cannon overboard in the middle of the night. However, he chooses to do this at the most inconvenient time, as it is now that the Hanseatic League has caught up to them. Needless to say, everyone dies except our two main characters. Stratebeka gets imprisoned while Mikkels goes into hiding and works as a servant in Marienhafen. There, he gets a visit by Lupe, who got saved by a fishing boat and who wants to save their former captain. Since he still harbors some bitterness towards Störtebeke for trashing the cannon, Mikkels at first doesn't want to, but Lupe convinces him anyway. The two then pose as guards, bringing him to the chopping block, but upon being discovered by the real guards, the three try a daring escape, at the end of which Mikkels sacrifices himself so that Störtebeke and Lupe can get away. The film then goes full circle, where we once again witness Stratopika's execution. Of course, we now know it's actually Mikkel's execution, but he uses his execution speech to make sure his friend and captain really stays anonymous. Ja, genau. Freiheit für Friesland. Denn das war ich. Frei. Keiner, der mir irgendwas befehlen konnte. Keiner, der nur, weil er als Pfeffersack geboren wurde, besser war als ich. Ich habe mir alles genommen, was ich wollte. Jeden Tag und jedes Jahr. Ich habe es ausgegeben und verprasst. Und jeder, der dabei war, wusste, was ihm blühen konnte. Jeder. Es gibt sehr viel, worauf ich stolz sein kann. Klaus Störtebecker! Denn das war mein Leben! Und ich will keine Sekunde davon missen. Keine. The last scene of the film shows Störtebecker together with some children, telling them the myths that have surrounded his execution. So eine Hinrichtung war ein Riesending. Ganz Hamburg war da. Es war ein riesengroßes Volksfest. Und dann wurde ihm der Kopf abgehauen? Einfach so? Nicht einfach so. Klaus Störtebecker ist noch zwölf Meter gerannt ohne Kopf und hat den Pfeffersäcken die Pest an den Hals gewünscht. Zwölf Meter ohne Kopf? Zwölf Meter. Oh, and also that we can have a title drop. The film then closes on Stratebeka imagining his old friend sitting next to him, filling Stratebeka's head with all sorts of legends he can tell about himself. So this was Zwölf Meter ohne Kopf, 40 feet headless. And as I've said at the beginning of this review, I was quite surprised given the low expectations I had going into this. So we'll start with some of the good stuff first. Firstly, I love the entire set as well as ship design, and it's definitely something different than seeing brigs, galleons, and Spanish colonial architecture all the time. Secondly, even though this film is technically just a PG-13 flick, I love the fact 
that it doesn't shy away from implied torture and murder. For example, remember the weapons trader who wouldn't sell them the catapult? Well, that's what's left of them after being shot at with the cannon. And of course the fact that this film features not only a near castration, but also a near beheading. Too bad it's only a PG flick though. And lastly, despite what I said about Schweighöfer in the beginning, I do love his performance as Goedeke Mikkels. This, of course, includes the near castration scene where we see just how insane Mikkels has become when contrasted with the ever more reasonable and level-headed Störtebeger. <sighs> Sadly though, there are a few things in this film that I just can't overlook. So let's take a look at them. Exhibit A is definitely the music. This especially includes the song being played in the DVD menu. <laughs> Me, or does this sound like a really, really bad he's a pirate ripoff? And that's not the only thing wrong with the music in this film. All right, I wouldn't say wrong per se, but the musical choice, in this case rock music, I think was made for a very specific reason. And that's to cash in on the success of quote unquote medieval bands like Santiano and Schuttmaul. And speaking of cashing in, I think this entire movie was just a cheap cash in on the entire Pirates franchise. Or at the very least, riding its coattails. Nevertheless, if you're looking for good fun entertainment and adventures on the high seas, this film is definitely for you. This was Das German Critic, and in the next episode, beer! Thank you.